Namaste. So, I'm back in my usual place. And I had a very interesting experience yesterday. After getting off of the plane, coming to my place, having lunch, and then taking a little nap, I woke up in a state of spontaneous samadhi. How can I explain it? It was like a vortex. Or if you've ever been swimming at the beach and there's an undertow, it just pulls you in. It was like that. And I went into this world, or I, I, not this world, I went into another world, which is all consciousness, all awareness and light, where there are no objects, only the subject, Brahman. And in this world, there's nothing but beauty and pleasure and knowledge. And by knowledge, I don't mean word knowledge. I mean direct perception of the truth. Now, for most of you, this won't mean anything because you don't have a similar experience that you can go back to and compare it with. But you do need to know that this is possible, that this is there waiting for you. This experience is the culmination of the yoga practice. Now we're going through Ramana Maharshi's Vichara Sangraham and the next verse is going to be a short course in the eight limbs of yoga. And so before I launch into that, I want to explain this experience so you can see it in that light. That from the point of view of self-realization, Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. I am pure awareness, not consciousness, not knowledge, not any kind of thinking, what to speak of doing and having. <laughs> Richard Clark made a nice comment on my video from the other day, the last video in the Vichara Sangraham series. And I replied that in my experience, having is simply bothersome. It's a botheration. It's like no end of trouble. Just like if you have a car, or you have a house, or you have a relationship, or anything, a body, huh? even your body, it requires constant attention, and maintenance. You have to control it. You have to arrange it. You have to have a place to put it. You have to fix it when it goes wrong. You have to put endless energy and time. And, and this is just a botheration. This is just trouble. Huh? Anytime you own something or you have something, it's going to be like that. So having is botheration. Doing is simply effort and friction and frustration. Huh? Think about work. Whenever you do any kind of work, whether it's for yourself or for someone else, there's friction. You're supposed to do X, 
and you try to do X and it doesn't work, <laughs> then you have to figure out what's wrong with it. Then you have to fix it. Then you go ahead and try to do X and maybe something else goes wrong and so on and so on. There's always friction. You're pushing against something. So there's a constant effort involved, constant extroversion of attention involved. And this is painful. So is the distraction and botheration caused by having. It's painful. It requires effort. It requires that you split off your consciousness and externalize it through the senses and do stuff in the world with your body, with your mind, with your senses. And this is painful. This is suffering. This is dukkha. Huh? And in the end, <laughs> whatever you have or whatever you do in the world is only temporary. It's going to pass away. You're going to lose it. Because, why? It's not self. It's not you. Yes, you can use the mental trick of identification and, or projection to make it seem part of yourself. But that's not the self with a capital S. That's the individual self with the lowercase s. The empirical self, the worldly self, the ego. And as we've discussed innumerable times on this channel, the ego is a fabrication. So any sense of I and mine is fabricated. It's artificial. It's an abstraction, simply an aggregation of certain thoughts, which Buddha goes into great detail in discussing in the Mula Pariyaya Sutta. So doing and having are really, really painful, really suffering. Having a body, having an ego, having an identity, what to speak of worldly possessions, titles, designations, honors, and so on. These are all painful. This suffering. Try to understand. Then there's thinking. <laughs> What is thinking? Thinking is simply daydreaming. It's dreaming while awake. You're having a conversation with yourself. Duh? What? <laughs> Talking to yourself, like in a dream. Hey, self. <laughs> You know, what do you think about this and that? The other thing. And again, there's an effort involved. One has to push against some resistance in the mind. Isn't it? Watch it closely and you'll see. Really, the mind and body are inert. They don't want to do anything. We have to push them to get them to, to function. <laughs> and this takes effort, and effort is painful. So even thinking is suffering. And it's also imagination, dreaming, another abstraction, another fabrication. And if we notice, take a good look at your mind, how many of your thoughts are wrong? How many are predictions about what's going to happen? Or guesses 
about somebody else's internal state. And then you find out later it's completely wrong. But then the mind immediately jumps to the next thought and the next thought. So we forget. This is Maya. This is the illusion. And next, there's knowing. Oh, I know so many things. I can quote from so many books. Huh? And of course, knowing involves consciousness. Consciousness is awareness with an object. So to know something, you have to be conscious of that knowledge. And that knowledge is usually in the form of words or other symbols, which means you have to learn the language in which they are expressed. Or in the, if it's a symbolic language, you have to learn what the symbols mean. So there's some effort there. And then you have to maintain that knowledge by going over it periodically. Just like if you learn a foreign language, you can learn it by immersion, by simply going to the country and speaking with the people in their native tongue. But then if you come back to your country and you stop using that language, after a while you'll forget. So knowledge has to be continually exercised. Otherwise, it evaporates. The brain says, oh, we haven't used this knowledge in six months or a year, so we can forget about it. Throw it out. It goes in the dustbin of the mind. <laughs> so knowledge in spiritual life, although it's necessary, one has to know so many things about the mind and the world and spirituality, consciousness, and so on. It's still not the highest goal. In fact, we call it the booby prize. Huh? I don't know about in other parts of the world, but in America, when there's some contest in school, the winners get, you know, the first prize, second prize, and third prize. And everybody else gets some token so that they don't feel bad. <laughs> this is called the booby prize. It's an American expression. I don't know if other people have it in the world. But uh, knowledge in spiritual life is the booby prize. So what if you can quote so many prayers and shlokas and scriptures? So what if you can discourse on the mechanics of Vedanta or yoga or this or that. So what? It's only words. Now, yes, words can point to something valuable. They can point to the reality. But we see so many times that people get attached to the words as the thing itself. And that's wrong. It's wrong because it's misleading. If you know about something by identification, you think that you know that thing, but you don't. You only know words about it. So knowledge and consciousness even. Consciousness means dividing the self into subject and object. Usually the object is one of the six senses, or the mind. I mean, including the mind. So the object is not the thing that we perceive. The object is simply the sense impression. Huh? When I see a beautiful landscape before me, I'm not seeing the landscape. I'm seeing what my eye sees from its point of view. I'm not seeing the thing as it is. I'm only seeing it from a certain point of view, and there are unlimited points of view. And the same with knowledge. 
Knowledge is relative to who is looking and where they're looking from. So knowledge is never complete until it becomes realization. And what is it about realization that's different? Well, realization is objectless. It does not involve uh, splitting the self into subject and object. It's spontaneous, effortless. Uh, it just happens. Once you uh, acquire the relevant qualifications, it simply happens to you. It's a blessing. And it's frictionless. There is no uh, dimension or measure for the mind to cling to in realization. And there is no work that has to be done. It's effortless. There is no object. So how can there be any work? It's effortless and it's frictionless. No work has to be done to maintain it. And similarly, it's boundaryless. It's without limitation, without end. And without boundaries means there is no division, there's no duality. And similarly, because of that, it's continuous, never ending, satyam, eternal, or really a better word is akala, timeless, eternal, transcendental, beyond everything, huh? even beyond the idea of beyond, because that's another boundary. And finally, it's transcendental bliss. It's so sweet. Once you taste it, you will want it again and again. And you will never be satisfied with anything else. Actually, we're not satisfied with anything else until we come to Turiya, Turiya Tita, which is the boundless, eternal self. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung.